Hi, and welcome to the second in a series of lectures about regression analysis. Uh, this uh, second lecture uh, builds on the concepts discussed in lecture one. Uh, our focus in this lecture is on simple linear regression. Uh, and you'll find uh, that in this lecture, uh, not only are we going to, dis going to discuss concepts, but we're also going to discuss uh, actual steps in uh, conducting regression analysis. A um, number of key points that we covered in the first lecture. Uh, one was the uh, concept of uh, dependent variable and independent variable, uh, where we uh, recognize that the object of our study, the primary focus, is our, usually our dependent variable. And we begin to uh, identify and analyze uh, independent variables that influence uh, our dependent variable. Uh, so we discussed that in lecture one. We also uh, discussed uh, collecting a bit of data about those variables, entering that data into a spreadsheet, and using features of Microsoft Excel uh, to generate uh, a scatter plot diagram. The reason we generated the scatter plot diagram was to examine the relationship to ensure that there was some degree of linearity, some sense that the data points, uh, as uh, we uh, see on our scatter plot, uh, really constitute some degree of reasonable line or, or linear relationship. Another thing we covered in lecture one was uh, once we can generate a line through our data points, is understanding the characteristics of that line. And so we used uh, the algebra um, concept of y equal mx plus b, uh, where we're suggesting that uh, the uh, that the line has both a y-intercept point where it crosses the, the y-axis, and that the line has a, a defined slope, which indicates the level of steepness of the line. And so when we discuss the concept of y equal mx plus b, uh, we, um, we agreed that the B point, the, the data B, is where is the y-intercept where the line crosses the y-axis, and that the mx is the slope of the line. Uh, also, we discussed in lecture one that uh, since we're doing statistics and we're using um, sample data instead of the entire, entire set of data, that we have a possibility of sampling error. And so we kind of reconstituted the, the formula just a little bit per our discussion in lecture one, where we said y hat is equal to b0 plus b1x, uh, where the b0 is the y-intercept, and the b1x is our slope format. You can always identify the slope, because it has the x variable included with it. The y-intercept usually stands by itself. Uh, the sum of squares concept was other very important uh, thing that we discussed. And with the uh, sum of squares, uh, we were able to take the distance, uh, the residual uh, distance that each point uh, was located away from the line, the data line. Um, and then we were able to sum uh, that number to get rid of negative numbers and to accentuate the larger distances. And then we were able to add up um, those, uh, the distances of each data point uh, from the line, uh, we were able to sum that, uh, to square them, and then add that total up, and it gives us the degree or the amount of the level of error associated with that line. And in regression, one of the things we're always trying to do is to build the best possible model. And the more error that we get in our sum of squares concept, sum of squares of the error concept, uh, the more error that we get, uh, the less uh, useful that a model might be. So those are key points that we discussed in lecture one. Now, uh, we're moving uh, in this lecture to simple linear regression. And our goal in simple linear regression is to make sure that we understand how to actually perform a uh, simple linear regression uh, activity to develop a model uh, to interpret the results of that model and then communicate them uh, depending on what our, our objective is to our, our, our customer, to whomever we want to communicate the results to. Um, our approach uh, is to uh, make sure that we first have selected our 
uh, dependent and independent variable. That we've collected some data about the dependent and independent variable uh, that we uh, uh, are able to uh, use a uh, scatter plot to make sure there's a linear relationship. Then to actually uh, use a statistical package of some sort uh, to actually run a regression uh, using the data that we've input uh, to uh, get the uh, information back from that regression uh, and then to understand that data. The data should be telling us that this is uh, how good of a model is this and it should be uh, giving us a, uh, an equation that we can use to actually predict um, um, certain uh, variables. So if we have a certain value in the future of an independent variable, we can use the equation to therefore depict what the estimated value would be of our dependent variable. And we'll come back to that and show that in a more concrete way. And then finally, uh, our uh, objective in this lecture is to make sure that we can think about uh, the details that we got back from running a regression analysis uh, and not only interpret them, but also to, to say, what does this all really mean? And so that's really important. Uh, as uh, you'll see when we go through the uh, upcoming slides, uh, Microsoft Excel is a very uh, good um, starting package uh, for doing uh, um, mathematics uh, and statistics uh, and algebra. Um, but what you'll see in a second is that uh, Excel has its limitations. It has a point uh, uh, which it does not do advanced statistical work like linear regression. Uh, and therefore, for this reason, which I'll get into in more detail, uh, you really need to, in order to do regression analysis, you need some sort of a more powerful package. And if you go to the internet and search, you can find some free statistical packages. But mostly uh, the uh, statistical packages that people generally use, uh, the most common is called SPSS. Another common one that's very useful is called Minitab. Uh, SAS is a statistical package. It's, it's on the expensive side, but maybe you have that in your workplace. And then with the, uh, some of the statistics textbooks, uh, they are accompanied by a uh, student edition, a free student edition of a product called Palisades Stat Tools. And that's the one that I'll be using for the work that I show you in this lecture. Uh, these packages offer greater, greater great benefits, uh, greater than Excel for sure. Uh, and as you'll see in a second, if you use Excel, you have to crunch a lot of detailed uh, numbers by hand to get the uh, regression equation that you're looking for. Um, and if you use a package, uh, you simply will input your, your data, your dependent variable data, and your independent variable data. You will select that you want a regression analysis done. You will identify in your data which is an independent variable and which is dependent variable. And then the, the package will generate the output for you, a lot of very useful uh, information. Um, and so uh, packages are, are much better than native Microsoft Excel. Uh, they improve, include improved scatter plots and regression output reports. Um, they give you more information and they generally show you things in a more graphic way than just native Microsoft Excel. So let's uh, begin our discussion of simple linear regression. Um, and we'll progress from the simple linear regression in this lecture to multiple linear regression in a subsequent lecture. Uh, simple linear regression is, uh, you know, as the word simple implies, uh, is done when we're only going to use two variables in our analysis. A dependent variable, which is the main uh, area of our analysis, and then one independent variable that that influences or has a relationship with, or at least we believe that, with the dependent variable. And so in simple linear regression, you will only have two variables. Um, the objective uh, of uh, conducting a linear regression is to uh, be able to analyze the, the relationship between these two variables. Uh, but another objective is also to, to, to build the best possible model that models this relationship and making sure that these two variables are, are, are good variables to use with each other, and we'll talk about that. So this idea of goodness of fit, 
which we talked about in lecture one, uh, comes into play again here in this lecture as well. Uh, and then uh, recognizing that you know once we've um, put the data in, we've run a regression, uh, we've started to look at the output that we're getting, uh, and we appreciate that the model is a reasonably good model. It's not a terrible model. Uh, we need to understand uh, what all the data in the output report that we've run tells us. Uh, we need to know what to do with that data and then how to use the results for our intended purpose. So let's uh, begin with an example. Uh, we'll continue the example that we started in lecture one. Uh, the owner of a small restaurant uh, is interested in understanding uh, if uh, he or she can predict uh, based on how much a person uh, uh, restaurant dinner bill is uh, what the likely tip amount will be associated with that with that bill. And so uh, that's the uh, problem that we're going to study uh, in this exam in this lecture. Um, we'd like to estimate uh, waiter compensation by predicting the amount of the tip to expect and uh, assuming we have pretty solid estimates of how much people are spending on their meals, then can we estimate how much our, our service staff will earn in the form of tips? So uh, we uh, assume in, in, in our example uh, that we've collected uh, six different meals and we've collected in, in for those meals the bill amount that was paid by the customer and the tip amount that they left. And so you can see in the diagram at the bottom here that I put this into Excel. Uh, I uh, enhanced it a bit over uh, le lecture one. Uh, at the top of the, uh, the, the columns, I indicated that the bill amount is my independent variable. It's, it's not the main thing I'm studying. The main thing I'm studying is in the second column, it's my dependent variable. I want to be able to estimate the tip amount. So that's the main thing. And so I'm saying, can I? Can I determine uh, the main thing, the, the tip amount, if I have uh, knowledge of the bill amount? And to what extent does the bill amount influence the tip amount? So that's sort of the relationship and the setting up of this model in terms of independent and dependent variable. Also notice at the bottom I did one additional thing. I uh, calculated the average bill based on the six uh, bills that were put in. And across the six items, the six amounts in column A, the average was $74. And I called that X bar, which means the average of the X variable, which is going to be my X axis when I generate a chart. And then I estimated the uh, average amount of the tip, which is the Y bar. Now, uh, one thing to remember is whenever you're plotting uh, um, data in Excel, the dependent variable is always the y-axis. It's always the axis that goes up and down. And so uh, that's why uh, you'll see at the bottom it says a y-bar, which means the average of y. And so I, I've already calculated here, and I actually used Excel functions, uh, which I think I'll show you in a second, uh, the average for x for the bill amount and the average for the tip amount. And that becomes useful data, as you'll see in a second. Um, now, remember our steps, um, and we discussed these briefly in our first lecture. Uh, the first thing you need to do when you have your data put into a spreadsheet is you need to ask yourself, is there a linear relationship between these, these two data items, bill amount and tip amount? Now, you could intuitively look at the information that you put in the spreadsheet, and you could say to yourself, yes, intuitively, it seems like there is a linear relationship um, between the bill amount and the tip amount. Um, but until it doesn't work uh, when we're doing uh, statistics, we need to actually prove things uh, mechanically. And so we used Microsoft Excel to generate a, um, a scatter plot. We did that in lecture one. But uh, I actually prefer the scatter plot generated by my uh, statistical package called StatSools. So again, in lecture one, I showed you that when you generate it with stat tools, you get a little more information. You get nicer headers and labels. And you also get at the very bottom a correlation coefficient, which we'll talk about in a second. So I generated a scatter plot. I look at the information uh, on the screen. I see these data points. 
and they kind of look like they're in a line, and so that's a useful thing. But I said to myself, boy, it'd be nice if I actually had a real line running through these data points. So I went back and I reran my um, scatter plot in Stat Tools, and I clicked on a particular option in Stat Tools to run a, a scatter plot to include the line. And so when I reran it, I got this line, and you can see again that this is a fairly reasonable linear relationship. So as long as we have a linear relationship, we can do linear regression, right? Uh, and we don't have a curved relationship, uh, in which case I couldn't use linear relation, linear re regression. So, so that uh, takes care of uh, the first step of you know, making sure that I have reasonable data to proceed with. Um, the other thing that you can check, uh, sort of a step three, is looking at that correlation coefficient. And if you remember uh, correlation from um, introductory statistics. Uh, you'll recall that uh, a plus one indicates a very strong, strongest possible relationship between two variables. A minus one indicates a very strong uh, inverse relationship, and the line would be moving downward. And then the zero represents a scatter plot. It's a very, it's a, it's a bad result. And so notice that we have a 0 0.866 uh, relationship or correlation uh, for these two pieces of data, the bill amount and the tip amount. And that tells me that the relationship between these two pieces of data is quite significant. Um, that and, and also it's positive in that the higher the bill amount, probably the higher the tip amount. And so I, I've got some very useful data. So this step three also kind of reinforces the fact that this is a, a reasonably good linear relationship. Step four, uh, we'll get into in a second. But uh, after you get past using Excel for scatter plots, uh, I have to say to you that uh, you know if you're going to use Excel for all of your regression analysis because you, you don't want to uh, go and find a statistical package, uh, you're going to cause yourself a bit of extra work. And uh, you'll recall uh, from uh, early years in school, we had to do arithmetic by longhand. And so uh, I say the same thing if you're using Microsoft Excel. You've actually got to, to understand the formula for regression, and you have to actually solve the formula to be able to get your regression equation. Because Microsoft Excel will not generate uh, regression uh, model output for you. And so I want to show you uh, in the next two steps uh, about this longhand method. And then I want to come back and say to you, why would you want to do that? Uh, just use a statistical package. However, I don't want you to skip these next couple of slides because uh, I want you to understand that w what the packages are doing under the covers, uh, what they're doing in, in terms of calculation for you. Because everything that I show you in the next couple of slides are actually done by the statistical tools. And it's useful to understand uh, conceptually what's happening uh, when you generate a statistical regression analysis. Uh, OK, so uh, just one more point that's not very useful to us um, is uh, that uh, if you were to take the, uh, you can see on the right hand side, uh, I told you earlier I calculated uh, the, uh, the averages for both the tip amount and the bill amount, and they were 74 and 10. And you can sort of see actually the formula that I used in Microsoft Excel to do that, the equal average formula, right? And so that, those are actually calculated using um, Excel. Now, the important thing to recognize is when you get the average of each of these things, this, these two numbers constitute what's called a centroid, which is a data point in your uh, chart which the line must run through. And the line will always run through the centroid or the average of the x variable and the y variable. So just something to keep in mind, not particularly useful, um, but worth mentioning. Now we're into step five, uh, the actual calculation that you would have to conduct if you use Microsoft Excel alone. Now, at first you look at this and you think, uh, geez, this looks complicated. Uh, but in reality, if you were to slow down just a bit, you would appreciate that it's not as complicated as it looks uh, at first blush. Now, what we're trying to do, you can see at the very top, we have a regression equation, y hat i equal b0, which is the y-intercept, plus b1 x xi, which is the slope. And so we really need to uh, 
to solve for this equation. We need this equation to be, uh, we need to know what the B0 is and the B1 uh, because that then gives us our <coughs> regression model. It's not just some formula, right? So we need to solve for B0 and B1. Uh, and so the first thing to recognize is that uh, uh, in solving for B1, uh, you are able to uh, also solve for beta 0. So the y-intercept is really a function of part of the slope. And so the first thing we do in the equation is we try to solve for B1. And there's a formula associated with that, the slope formula, and here it is. Now, the thing I want to mention to you about both these formulas, the slope formula and the y-intercept formula, is there's an awful lot of uses of x-bar and y-bar. And we did discuss on a previous slide, and I'll step back and show you the previous slides briefly, that the x-bar is 74, which is the average of the bill, and the y-bar is 10, which is the average of the tip. So uh, one of the easy things to do when you look at this formula is to take every place where you see an x-bar or a y-bar and put 74 and 10 and 74, and you come over here to this side where the intercept is, and you put 10 for the y-bar and 74 for the x-bar, and you've already eliminated a lot of the complexity of this equation. It now has gotten very simple, even though it may not look like that to you. And so, uh, and so uh, it's not as complicated as it seems because a lot of the content of this regression uh, equation is really uh, the mean of the meal amount and the mean of the tip amount. Now, in order to uh, solve for x sub i and y sub i, which is the other things that we need to know, uh, we build a chart. And I'm going to show you the chart in a second. Um, and I'm going to carry this formula, this B1 formula, onto the next slide. So just uh, the next slide has a lot of detail on it. Um, but in the upper right-hand corner here, you can see my B1 formula carried here from the previous slide. And again, appreciate that uh, x bar is 74 and y bar is 10. So what I really need to do is I need to understand my x values and my y values. And where do I get the x values and the y values from? I get them from the original data that was input to the problem. So these are my meal amounts here under total bill. Uh, you can see at the bottom the average meal amount is 74. And then here are my tip amounts. Uh, you can see in this column uh, the amounts of tips for each one of the meals. Uh, now I take this xi uh, minus x bar, which really is 34 minus the average, which was 74, and I got minus 40. And then I take 108 minus 74, and I got 34. So all I'm doing is I'm subtracting this x amount from the mean, from this amount here. And that gives me these values in this column. Then guess what? I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to subtract this 5 uh, from, from 10. And so 5 minus 10 is minus 5. And then I'm going to do the same thing for each one of these values. And so you can see in this column here that says yi minus y bar, I've got my results here. So all I've done in order to create um, these pieces of this equation in the upper right hand corner is I've just taken the uh, values that I received in my original data collection effort. I've uh, subtracted those values from the averages and I've got these values in the middle two columns. Now notice that the formula continues on at the top. It says sum of xi minus, minus x bar times yi minus y bar and so I have all of the values now for this summation. So all I need to do is to multiply these out, which is four, minus 40 times minus 5, which is 200. Right? And I have 34 times 7, 238. Minus 10 times 1 is minus 10, and so on. And then to get the summation of, of those values, I simply add the deviation products up, and I get 615. So the top number in this equation is 615. When I look at the uh, bottom number in the equation, xi minus x squared, uh, I get these values here. And you can see xi minus x is from 
the bill deviation, the fourth column. So at minus 40 squared is 1600. So I simply uh, follow these conventions here. I add up the squared values of xi minus x bar, and I get 4206. So in order to ca I go back to my formula, uh, b1 is equal to uh, the sum of these values divided by the sum of these values. I substitute my 615 and my 4206. I do the division, and I find that the slope of this equation is 0.1462. Very useful information, and we'll come back to that in a second. Now, once I've solved for B1, I come back to my y-intercept equation, which is on the left side bottom here, where it's uh, y bar, which is 10, minus B1, which is 0.1462, uh, times uh, 74. And I can substitute that, right? So you can see in the next line, there's the average of y, 10, minus 0.1462, which we just solved, B1, times 74, which is the average of the meal amounts. And so I just do the math here, right? I multiply 74 times 0.1462, and I get 10.8188, and I get 10 minus 10.188. And once I do that, I come up with a negative, a y-intercept of negative 0.8188. And so I take these values now, and I can rebuild my original um, equation, and I can say that for this particular problem, uh, my regression equation, uh, y hat, is equal to uh, a slope of 0.1462x minus a y-intercept, and a y-intercept of minus 0.8188. So you can see what you would have to do manually if you did this in Excel. Uh, at first blush, it might seem complicated, but if you thought about this for a bit, you'd find that it's not really all that complicated. But why should we do this, right? What we really want are these values at the bottom. We want the um, slope of 0.462x. We want the y-intercept of minus 8188. And that's what we want uh, a statistical package to give us. And so uh, now let's in interpret those values, because this is now your regression equation for the meal amounts and, and the tip amounts uh, based on the six values that we that we input. And what it says, what this equation says, uh, and this is how we interpret a regression equation, is it says uh, for every one dollar uh, of increase in the bill, uh, we look at the intercept, um, so we look at the slope value, uh, I'm going to get an approximately 15 cent increase in tip. That's what this means. This means that uh, if you look at the uh, at the slope, the value in the slope is the increase in the dependent variable every time you increase your independent variable by a dollar. And so that's very useful. Now, if you look at the y-intercept, it's a little bit a little bit um, illogical because it says uh, I mean, since the y-intercept represents where y is equal to zero, uh, then uh, if, in fact, um, you know, there's no tip, uh, what this is sort of suggesting is, um, sorry, uh, what this suggests is if the uh, meal amount is zero, that the tip amount will be negative 0.81. And there's no such thing as a negative tip, right? And there's unlikely to be a meal amount of zero. So uh, sometimes you get uh, the y-intercept being a piece of data that's not uh, really uh, relevant to us right now. And so we have to take that into account, and we'll, we'll talk about that later. Anyway, what's important here is the fact that our regression equation tells us if the meal amount goes up by a buck, the tip amount is likely to go up by 15 cents, and that's useful. Now, second thing we can do is we can take that equation, and we can actually take our meal amounts that we have, because that's what the x represented. I'm going to go back to the previous slide. This x amount represents the meal amount. And so uh, if you uh, take this equation, uh, you can see that um, in, in this particular case, uh, if I were to substitute the meal amounts that I had recorded earlier into my equation, I would get a forecasted tip. Now look at this. In the first case where I had a $34 bill, I substitute the 34 in place of the X. I do the math. And, and my estimated tip is $4.15.
Now, but we also know the actual tip was $5. And so in this case, we can see a little bit of variation between the predicted tip amount and the actual tip amount. We do the same thing with the second, um, the second set of data. Um, we have $108 meal amount, and uh, we plug that into the formula, and so the prediction is a almost $15 tip, and the actual tip was 17 So you can see that there's still some variation here. Uh, again, a $64 tip should generate, uh, sorry, $64 bill should generate an $8 tip, but it generate an $11 tip. And so this starts to, to have the wheels turning for you. If our model gives us an estimate, and yet the actual amount is different than the estimated amount, uh, we have to start wondering what other factors could have caused the tip amount to be different from the predicted tip amount. And that's very useful. I'll end this lecture uh, posing that same question back to you again. What other variables could have be causing the actual tip amount to not be the predicted tip amount? Because clearly uh, in our equation, we've only looked at the relationship between the bill and the tip. Uh, we haven't looked at other reasons why the tip amount might go up or down, uh, and we've only looked at the meal amount. And so we'll come back to that issue at the end. But what we really want to do is we really want to use st statistical package. We want to use something like stat tools or SPSS. And so um, we're going to uh, do that. We're going to talk about how to do regression analysis. So uh, another thing is we haven't talked yet about in our simple linear regression about whether this is a good model or a bad model, but we'll do that in a second. So let's uh, cover how to do simple linear regression um, so we can sort of keep your interest up, because I know after showing you all those numbers on the previous two slides, I could be losing you and I could have you saying, that's why I don't like statistics, and I don't want to lose you. Okay, so I'm going to use Palisades stat tools, as I mentioned. Um, I've already input the data into my spreadsheet. You can see I've shown it here to you on this slide. Um, the uh, next thing I have to do, um, because Stat Tools really works with Excel, is I have to uh, open up my Excel spreadsheet that contains this data, and then I have to start up Stat Tools. And that's just as simple as clicking on Stat Tools while the Excel spreadsheet is open. And so Stat Tools. Uh, becomes uh, part of the Excel work that I'm doing. Another thing I have to do in Stat Tools is I have to go through and tell Stat Tools that, that I have bill amount here in column A in cells 3 through 8, and I have tip amount here in column B in cells B3 through B8. So I have to do that as well. I have to define the data to Stat Tools, but that's just a function of Stat Tools. Uh, this is at me actually uh, running a regression. So I've opened Excel. Uh, you can see the data that I've typed in here on the left-hand side. Uh, I've also started Stat Tools, and if you look at the top, you see Home, and Insert, Page Layout, so on. And when you get to the far right-hand tab, it says Stat Tools. You won't have that tab if you have, or if you're not using Stat Tools. It's not in Excel. But uh, after I opened Excel, I started Stat Tools, and that tab came up. And then there's a lot of options over here. And this first option on the far left, where it says Data in Data Set Manager is where I had to tell Stat Tools that in column, in cells A3 through A8, I have bill amount, and in cells B3 through B8, I have tip amount. I had to do that first, okay, but that's already done. The next thing I want to do is I want to run a regression, and so you can see this option, and I've circled it here on the slide, where it says Regression and Classification. I click on that, I click on Regression, and this dialog box on the right-hand side comes up. And so you can sort of see the uh, dialog box on the right-hand slide. Now, the only things that I did in this dialog box is I checked my independent variable, independent variable. And it's very important to do this correctly, right? Uh, and we've said all along that we're really trying to focus on can I predict the tip amount. So the tip amount is a dependent variable. Uh, and then uh, my bill amount is the independent variable. I want to be asking myself to what extent does the meal amount influence the tip amount. So that's my, my independent variable. I didn't change any of the other options down here, and I'm not going to get into the details about what they do, because some of you may not be using stat tools. Uh, I just left them the way they were. I came down and clicked on the OK button here, and once I did that, uh, I got some information back. 
Now this is your typical uh, regression uh, output. If you're using SPSS or Minitab or something else, it may look different than this. But this is what you get back when you're using stat tools. And so uh, if you look at this information uh, and you start to stare at it a little bit, uh, you're going to say to yourself, hmm, I don't know what any of this means. Um, and if you look around, you might start to see things that look familiar, like p-value. Um, this is your significance level. And so um, you might not really appreciate uh, any of this content. You can see down the bottom here on the left, it does say bill amount. But notice it doesn't say any place on this uh, output the tip amount except at the very top where it indicates the variable as tip amount. So I've got all of this information back. And the most important thing as a person that's new to regression analysis, or, or if it's been a long time, is to be able to understand what each of these pieces of information have. And so I'm going to show you on the next slide, uh, I'm going to have circled each piece of information, each useful piece of information on my output. And I'm going to have highlighted in red. Now this would be a very useful uh, PowerPoint uh, for you to print out and keep handy, especially if you're going to work problems in a class. Because it explains to you uh, all the different uh, elements. And the slide after this is going to explain sort of how to interpret them and what they mean. So I'm going to move through this, uh, this slide here uh, and explain to you uh, what you uh, have gotten back with your regression analysis. So we run a, a simple regression analysis, simple because it has two, two variables, one dependent and one independent. And I get the most, uh, the first important piece of information I get back here at the top, I've labeled it number A, is the called the coefficient of determination. And you don't have to remember that, but you need to remember that the R square and the adjusted R square uh, are really talking about uh, how uh, much, uh, how strong the relationship is between the uh, meal amount and the bill amount. And another way of thinking about it is um, for this analysis, um, to what extent does the meal amount change explain the, the total tip amount? And what this says, when you look at just the R square, it says that 75% of the variation in the tip is caused by meal amount, because those are the two variables we're looking at. Now, that's useful to know, 75%. Well, what do we also know? We know that 25% of the change in tip amount is not caused by um, the, the meal amount. And that goes back to what we were talking about a minute ago, uh, which is, uh, you know, when I actually used the regression equation to predict the uh, tips, and then I looked at the actual tips and I saw some differences, uh, I had to ask myself, well, geez, you know, something else must be accounting for these these changes because the meal amount itself uh, doesn't really explain the whole the whole amount of the tip. And so when you start to think about that, and you think, about, well, what else could it be besides the meal amount? Well, it could be the quality of the service. It could be a person's propensity to tip. Some people are cheaper tippers, and some people are more generous tippers, right? And there's other variables as well. So. And that account, those set of variables account for 25% of the variation in bill. But 75% of the determining that amount of a tip is really determined by the meal amount. So that's what this 0.75 means. Now, the adjusted R square is always slightly less than the R square. And it doesn't really mean a whole lot at this point. But once we get to multiple regression and we introduce additional independent variables at the same time, the adjusted R square will become more important. So uh, at this point, if you're doing simple linear regression, uh, you could either use the adjusted R square or the R square. Just make sure you explain which one you're using to talk about how much of the variation, uh, how much of the relationship is caused um, by the independent variable that you're using. Okay, and if you're using the adjusted R square, it's 67% uh, of the change is 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 caused by or influenced by Muleman. Okay, if you're using the R square, it's 75%. They're always, they're always have this uh, approximation, but we'll get to this more in multiple regression. Now, the standard error of the estimate uh, is not used by a lot of people. I think it's a very useful um, piece of information. You know, what it tells us is that uh, along our regression line, that there's a uh, couple of parallel lines, uh, plus uh, 2.7 uh, away, uh, higher than the line, 
and negative 2.74 below the line. There's these two parallel lines. And what this is telling us is that all of the data points that we plotted uh, are within 2.74 uh, dollars of the, um, of the line that we plotted. And that's kind of useful because it tells us, uh, you know, this is a fairly tight uh, set of data. And if that standard error estimate gets very large, it means that the data points, the residuals, the error, is pretty far from the line. So it, it's kind of a useful thing. And it kind of goes hand in hand with some of the other things we'll, we'll discuss or look at on this slide. If I look at the uh, C, the item number C in red, uh, the significance, uh, and we can see that the, uh, um, the significance of the relationship here is uh, 0.0259. And generally, we, we like to have a relationship that is uh, less than 0 0.05, so within 95%, which is two standard deviations. And we say that if, it, if the significance is uh, 0 0.05 or less, that we have a significant relationship between variables. And so uh, in this case, uh, 0 0.02 is less than 0 0.05, and therefore we can suggest to ourselves that there's a, there's a significant relationship between the meal amount and the tip amount. So anytime it's less than 0 0.05, you do have a useful uh, model here because uh, the two variables have a significant relationship to each other. And we'll talk about these things later, uh, especially when we get into uh, multiple regression. Uh, now, if you look uh, down uh, towards the bottom here, um, you see these confidence intervals of 95%. Uh, these are really the characteristics of your data distribution and your standard deviation um, back in descriptive statistics. And we're not going to pay a lot of attention to those at this point. Uh, if I'm moving to the left now along the bottom, you can notice that the p-value for bill amount along the bottom is the same value as the p-amount the p-value for the entire analysis of variance, the top for the entire regression model. And the reason they're the same is because we're using simple linear regression. Uh, what you'll find that when we get to multiple regression is that listed down here at the bottom will be each of the independent variables. The p-values for the different independent variables will vary, and they will not match the p-value for the entire equation. So when you're trying to look at whether the um, regression itself is significant, you have to look at this uh, p-value here in the middle in the analysis of variance table. Um, when you uh, get uh, a little further along, you'll see a t-value. And the t-value is something we'll come back to in our next lecture, because it has to do with multicollinearity. And that's only uh, significant to us when we have more than one independent variable. So we'll understand this concept of multicollinearity later, uh, and it'll uh, be more, more uh, useful to us when we introduce multiple independent variables. Uh, coming across at the bottom, you can see uh, the regression equation and where that comes from. And it's very important that you appreciate how to interpret uh, these bottom uh, pieces of data that I have circled. Right? So when you look at the bill amount and you look at the 0.1462 uh, coefficient, that coefficient represents the uh, primary factor in the slope that, that tells us for every dollar increase in the bill amount, the tip amount, the, the dependent variable, increases by 15 cents. And so what it's saying here is when the bill amount goes up by a dollar, the variable indicated at the very top of this, this page, tip amount goes up by 15 cents. Okay, and I'll, I'll say that again. When the uh, value on the left bill amount uh, increases by one dollar, the dependent variable goes up by 14 cents. That's very important to appreciate. And then right above that, in the constant, uh, this is the constant is our y-intercept. And so again, I have another way here of knowing or recognizing um, where my y-intercept is located on my data line. Uh, notice that these two numbers are slightly different. That has to do with rounding errors, and so we're not going to get too caught up by the fact that that tool's um, rounded in a slightly different way. Um, they both really are 0.82. And so the y-intercept is minus 0.82. Okay, so that's useful to know as well. Uh, now, we'll come over here to what I've labeled E on the diagram, uh, the standard error. And the uh, standard error is um, tells us how, how much error exists in the particular model. And uh, in this case, it's 
0.042, which is a really good number. Low number is very good for standard error. Then we come up here to S, the sum of square of error, the SSE. We spent an entire uh, lecture one on understanding how much error exists in our model. Uh, remember in lecture one, we calculated the sum of the square of error for just the, uh, the dependent variable for just the bill amount, and it came up to 120. And we said that's the worst uh, error that we are likely to have. And so we can compare this number 30 uh, back to the 120, and we can say to ourselves, uh, this is really a very strong model. That sum of square of errors is quite low. And so that's what sum of squares uh, for the unexplained uh, variable tells us. And so uh, we've stepped through this. Uh, I won't take a lot more time, but we'll come back and do this again when we do uh, multiple regression. We'll go through the same output and make sure that you can understand uh, the basic pieces of data that are being reported to you. Now we get to uh, a point where we have to ask ourselves, well, what does all this mean? Well, uh, at the top of the uh, model, uh, the R square and the adjusted R square, which are called the coefficient determination, indicated that this model accounts for 75% of the relationship, uh, explains 75% of the change between the independent variable and dependent variable. Uh, but there's 25% of something else that's causing the change as well. And we won't think about that now because we're doing simple linear regression. When we do multiple regression, we might think about that some more and try to get that number to go to go even higher, to to have a model that explains closer to 90, 95, 99 percent of all the change in our dependent variable. Uh, we noted that the range of error um, is plus or minus uh, 2.74 along the regression line. This tells us that the um, that the, the points that we plotted uh, in our um, scatter plot are, are all fairly close to the regression line itself. And I'll just show you a, a visual of that on the next slide. Uh, we identified that the significance of this model is 0 0.026, which is less than 0 0.05. Then the acceptable range, we can conclude that this is a reasonably good model. Uh, we noted that the uh, equation is useful for predicting uh, tip increase, because for every $1 in the bill amount, uh, we noted that the uh, using the slope value, we noted that the tip amount will increase 15 cents. Uh, we also noted that the standard error is low, it's 0 0.0422, which is a good thing. And we noted that the uh, sum of square of the errors is 30.07, and if you think back to when you only had a dependent variable, the error size was 120, and this is a much smaller number than 120. So we've got a lot of indicators here this is a good model, it's a good model that we could use. So based on all of the above, we conclude that the regression model has produced a good fit, explains 75% of the interaction with only 25% unexplained error. Now I did show you here range of error is plus or minus uh, 2.74, and just to show you visually what that looks like, um, and I had a little difficulty getting my red dots in here, that this plus or minus 2.74 pictorially would look like this, and it would say to us that the range of error is uh, between these two dotted uh, dashed red lines, and that indicates where all the dots lie. And a 2.74 is a very nice tight uh, range of error. It suggests a fairly strong linear relationship. So uh, what do we do with this information? Uh, well, if you're doing research, you can come back and say, you know, we've uh, conclusively determined that there's a significant relationship. Remember, we had uh, less than 0.05. Uh, between the independent variable of meal and the dependent variable of tip. We, we also uh, concluded that based on a number of other factors, including sum of, sum of square of the errors and some other things that we just discussed. From a practical uh, management perspective, the owner can add up total bills for any given day and estimate how much the uh, serving staff is likely to earn. Uh, from a performance uh, perspective, and we didn't talk about this, if we went back to our six, six data points on our chart and we added the waiter name to each data point and looked for patterns, we might see that uh, one waiter is uh, named by the highest points on the chart and another waiter's name is by the lowest points on the data chart. And that might tell us that, uh, in fact, uh, the one waiter is better than the other at generating tips. They, whatever they're doing, they're doing it very well, and so their service is usually tipped better than the other waiter. 
as an analyst, what might we consider, uh, think about? Uh, well, since, as I mentioned earlier, we might think that, well, since the bill only accounts for 75%, what other factors are influencing the tip amount? And so we could start thinking about moving on to multiple regression and perhaps adding other independent variables, such as service quality, speed of the meal, which might be the speed of the meal, or friendliness of the waiter, or attentiveness of the waiter, or the fact that the waiter signed the check. Uh, and we might also consider customer frugality, uh, the inclination to believe a large, small, or a precise tip. And, uh, and you have to ask yourself, can you measure these things? And if you can't measure them, then you really can't use statistics. But if you can measure them, uh, perhaps we can uh, maybe build an even more uh, interesting model than what we have here. How can we measure other, these other potential independent variables is another thing you would think about. And then we'd recognize that if we want to add customer frugality as a variable, we'd have to ask the customers to rate their frugality at the beginning of a meal, perhaps. Um, but, uh, but that would require uh, doing the analysis if we add other independent variables. We can't do it with simple linear regression. We have to go to multiple linear regression. So uh, this is the end. Uh, goal, our goal or objective here was to understand how to perform a li simple linear regression, how to interpret the results and communicate them to your customer. Uh, I wanted to make sure that you were clear about uh, the basic idea of why we use simple linear regression. We use it for only two variables. Uh, we use it to generate a forecasting equation, uh, and we use it to see if uh, a couple of variables, uh, um, to what extent do those two variables uh, explain each other. Um, we uh, wanted to make sure that you understand the underlying concepts. That's why I went through the math. Um, but we also uh, probably don't want to do the math ourselves. We want to let the computer's software do it. Uh, so I wanted you to see how to set up the data, how to run a simple linear regression, how to look at the results to look at uh, whether this is a good model. Uh, to see if uh, the model can be improved, and we didn't talk about that, um, but it was implicit in some of what we did, to understand how to interpret the results and then think about what the results mean in practical terms. So uh, it's been a long lecture, uh, but we had a lot to cover. Uh, I hope it's been helpful to you in some ways. Uh, come back again for lecture three, and we'll talk about multiple linear regression.